Hello and welcome to Microbiology Insider. In this video, we will be taking on the course Microbiological Techniques and Biotechnology. And our topic for today will be the methods used in controlling microbial growth. Microorganisms are of course beneficial to humans. However, many have undesirable effects, such as those that cause food spoilage and many diseases to plants animals and humans. Both physical as well as chemical methods can be used to control microbial growth. The physical methods used to control microbial growth are heat, radiation and filtration, whereas some of the most common chemical sterilants are ethylene oxide, bleach, hydrogen peroxide, glutaraldehyde and formaldehyde. The first physical method we will be talking about is heat, which can be further divided into moist heat and dry heat. Methods that employ moist heat include Autoclaves are widely used for heat sterilization. The commonly used steam heated to a temperature of 121 to 134 degrees Celsius to achieve sterility. A holding time of 15 minutes at 121 degrees Celsius or 3 minutes at 134 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 15 psi is required for prior elimination. To ensure the autoclaving process was able to cause sterilization, most autoclaves have metals and charts that record or display important information such as temperature and pressure as a function of time. Indicator tape is often placed on packages of products prior to autoclaving. A chemical in the tape may change color when the appropriate condition has been reached. Biological indicators can also be used to confirm autoclave performance. Most biological indicators contain spores of the heat-resistant microbe Geobacillus thermophilus. For effective sterilization, steam needs to penetrate the autoclave uniformly. Hence, an autoclave must not be overcrowded and the lids of containers and bottles must not be fully closed. Pasteurization is used to kill unwanted bacteria, yeast and mold in certain fluids. It involves control heating at temperatures below boiling. This method is widely used for reading milk, beer and food of spoilage organisms and bacterial pathogens. The temperature and time used vary according to organisms present and the heat stability of the material. Note that pasteurization is not equivalent to sterilization. Thirdly, we have tindalization. This technique involves boiling for a period of 20 minutes at atmospheric pressure, cooling and incubating for a day. The mixture is then boiled, cooled and incubated for a day for the second time. It is boiled, cooled and incubated for a day again and finally boiling. The three incubation periods are to allow the heat resistance pores that survived the previous boiling period to germinate into the heat sensitive stage which can be killed by the next boiling steps. This is effective because many spores are stimulated to grow by the heat shock. This procedure only works for media that can support bacteria growth. It will not sterilize plain water. Tindalization is ineffective against browns. Let's move on to the dry heat methods used in controlling microbial growth. Dry heat sterilization is accompanied by conduction. That is, heat is being absorbed by the steroid surface and passed inward to the next layer. 
Eventually, the entire item reaches a temperature needed to achieve sterilization. The proper time and temperature for dry heat sterilization is 160 degrees for 2 hours or 170 degrees centigrade for 1 hour. Instruments should be dry before sterilization since water will interfere with the process. Dry heat destroys microbes by causing coagulation of protein. Methods that employ dry heat are hot air oven. Hot air oven can be operated from 50 to 300 degrees and are commonly used to sterilize glassware, metals, and objects that won't melt. They do not require water and there is not much pressure built up within the oven, unlike an autoclave, making them safer to work with. Secondly, we have incineration. This will burn any organism to ash. It is used to sanitize medical and other biohazardous waste before it is discarded. Lastly, we have flaming. Flaming is used to sterilize loops and straight wires in microbiology labs. Leaving the loop in the flame of a benzene burner or alcohol lamp until it glows red ensures that an infectious agent is inactivated. Flaming is commonly used for small metal or glass objects and not for large objects. The second physical method used to control microbial growth that we will be looking at is radiation. Sterilization methods that employ radiation include X-rays. X-rays are a form of ionizing energy, allowing to radiate large packages and pallet loads of medical devices. The penetration is sufficient to treat multiple pallets of loads. Secondly, we have UV light. UV light irradiation is useful only for sterilization of surfaces and some transparent objects. UV light irradiation is routinely used to sterilize the interior of biological safety cabinets between uses. Lastly, we have gamma rays. Gamma rays are very penetrative and commonly used for sterilization of disposable medical equipment, such as syringes and IV sets. Gamma radiation requires bulky shading for the safety of the operator. A third physical method used to control microbial growth that we will be looking at is filtration. Clear liquid that will be damaged by heat, irradiation, or chemical sterilization can be sterilized by filtration. This method is commonly used for sensitive pharmaceutical and protein solutions. Now let's take a look at the chemical methods used in controlling microbial growth. Chemicals are also used for sterilization. Although heat provides the most reliable way to rid objects of all transmissible agents, it is not always appropriate because it will damage heat sensitive materials such as biological materials, electronics, and many plastics. Some common chemical sterilants are ethylene oxide. This gas is commonly used to sterilize objects sensitive to temperatures greater than 60 degrees centigrade, such as plastics, optics, and electronics. Ethylene oxide penetrates well, moving through paper, blood, and some other materials and is highly effective. Ethylene oxide can kill all known viruses, bacteria, and fungi, including bacterial spores. However, it is highly flammable and requires a longer time to sterilize than any heat treatment. This process also requires a period of post-sterilization aeration to remove toxic residues. Ethylene oxide is the most common sterilization method used for over 70% of total sterilization 
and for 50% of all disposable medical devices. Secondly, we have bleach. Chlorine bleach is an acceptable liquid sterilization agent. Household bleach contains 5.25% of sodium hypochlorite. It is usually diluted to one-tenth immediately before use. However, to kill microbacterium tuberculosis, it should be diluted only to one feet and one second and a half to inactivate browns. Bleach will kill many organisms immediately, but for full sterilization, it should be allowed to react for 20 minutes. Bleach is highly corrosive. Bleach decomposes over time when exposed to air, so fresh solutions should be made daily. Thirdly, we have glutaraldehyde and formaldehyde. These are acceptable liquid sterilants, provided the immersion time is sufficiently long. To kill all spores in a clear liquid can take up to 12 hours with glutaraldehyde and even longer with formaldehyde. Glutaraldehyde and formaldehyde are volatile and toxic by both skin contact and inhalation. Many vaccines are sterilized with formaldehyde. Lastly, we have hydrogen peroxide. This is a strong oxidant and its oxidizing properties allow it to destroy a wide range of pathogens. In medical sterilization, hydrogen peroxide is used at high concentrations, ranging from 35% to 90%. So we've come to the end of this lecture. Before you leave, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, give this video a thumbs up and turn on your notification so whenever I upload a new content, you won't be left out. You can also follow us on various social media platforms through the handles that are being displayed on the screen.